Welcome to Missionary Roundtable with your host, Kale Horvath. Welcome back to Missionary Roundtable. My name is Kale Horvath. I'm your host, and I'm excited to be with you again this week as we continue to discuss the Great Commission and the implications that the Great Commission has on our lives as Christians in the New Testament, and as we look at the Great Commission through the lens of pastors and missionaries who are taking part in that work all throughout the world. Excited to be with you guys again. Thanks for listening. This week, we have a very special guest on the show. Uh, His name is Jake Tobby. He is a missionary and a pastor and an author. We'll get to that in just a minute, but he's uh, he was a missionary to the country of China for seven years, and he's now been serving in the country of Taiwan since 2014. He's got a book out that we will mention and talk about as we go throughout the episode called Send Me, I'll Go, Letting the Mission Choose Your Direction, and that, uh, I'm assuming, is available on Amazon and stuff, and uh, we'll let Jake plug it, but Jake, thanks so much for being on, man. How you doing? Doing good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, I, I want the audience. Um, I've known you, uh, you know, from afar for a while. You were at a missions conference years ago at our church. Our church has been supporting you for a, a number of years. Um, but I have a feeling a lot of my friends and the people listening to these podcasts don't know you as well as I do. So I, I would love for them to get to know you through this. Um, you were in China for seven years. You've been in Taiwan since 2014. Uh, what's your story? How How did God, so this is a big question, but how did God lead you down to the path of going into foreign missions with your life? Yeah, I, uh, um, I didn't really have much, I wouldn't say a very dramatic calling experience, I guess. I, um, I was desirous of being involved in missions and I had some friends who were uh, really influential in my life and they were always giving me books and inviting me to go hear missionary speakers. And, um, I had a missionary mentor who's extremely influential in my life. And he encouraged me to think about this part of the world, encouraged me to think about China. And so I didn't have any better plans really. And so I knew the kind of the first thing I would need to do would be to learn Chinese. And so I, you know, I just kind of looked around and found the first people that I knew that were in China and they happened to be in the Northeast corner of, of China and up in the cold, you know, uh, part, the terrible, part to live. And so I went up there and I, and I, I, so we just moved there. I moved there, uh, three months after my wife, Steph and I got married. Wow. Nice. Yeah. yeah, It was pretty, it was pretty intense. Um, but it was, it was great. And so we moved there 2007 and started studying Chinese full time. Awesome. Uh, did you grow up in church? Uh, I know uh, you're from Ohio. Look me, you're a Buckeye. Yeah. 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 I grew up, I grew up in church, uh, from Middletown, Ohio, which is, Southwest uh, Ohio from Grace Baptist Church there. Is that uh, Cincinnati, Dayton area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Middletown is kind of halfway between Dayton and Cincinnati. Okay. It's, it's a good, good, good part of Ohio to be from. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, especially, um, I, I don't know if you track on the other side of the world there, college football and stuff, but I guess Cincinnati just drafted their quarterbacks. So. Um, oh, really? I'm a Browns fan, so I don't know. We don't need to talk about that anyway. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so excited to have you on. Jake is coming to us, uh, from 12 time zones away right now. So I'm recording this at, uh, eight 30 in the evening and it's eight 30 the next day in the morning for Jake. So thanks so much, man, for uh, working this out. I really appreciate it. Um, I do want to plug your book again, really quick. Send me, I'll go. You wrote this in, uh, 2015. It looks like, I think it came out. That sounds, that sounds about right. Yeah, I have the I, book in front of me. I'll, uh, I'll just look. <laughs> Yeah, 2015. I didn't know that. You know, when you write a book, it, it generally come out a good bit after you after you write the. You know, I naively thought you finished writing a book and you know you'd see it on a shelf the next. Yeah, you probably next. worked on it for a long time before that. Yeah, well, I mean, it was kind of it was kind of like an overflow thing. I, I found myself having the same conversations all the time with uh, about missions mm-hmm. with young people, and it's one of those things where you know I, I felt I was getting closer to. Kind of crafting answers to these questions that I was hearing a lot, and I uh, and you know so I wanted to create a, a resource that even if I met a young person just you know who was, had questions about missions, if I just met them one time, I could kind of put something in their hands and hope that that would kind of lead them through that entire process of thinking through missions and their involvement mm-hmm. in it. 
And so it kind of, it really just came out in like a burst. I wrote most of it in a week. I got, I got sick. I got like tonsillitis or something like that. I couldn't <laughs> talk. I was just stuck in my house. And I probably wrote, you know, 75% of the book. Just wow. Just puked it on the page. Yeah. yeah nice. Yeah. That's exactly. awesome. Yeah. Well, I, and so I, I have read the book, so I'm, I'm not going to be the talk show host who plugs a book and hasn't read it. Um, yeah. but it, it is a very good book, very thought provoking. And really you, you do cover a ton of topics like send me, I'll go letting the mission choose your direction. Sounds like a book. That's all it's going to do is try to persuade you to go to the mission field, which, which you do absolutely. But you really cover a, a lot of different facets about missions. What is great commission ministry and, and stuff like that, which, uh, which I found really intriguing. Yeah, I wanted to cover a lot, of, and I'm not totally satisfied with it. And inevitably, you leave some. You know, missions is a big topic, and I, I think I left some stones uh, unturned. And I've had people ask, "What about this? What about that?" And I've realized there's you know, there's certain subjects I I broached, for example, like about you know I think I mentioned in passing that I think the interpretation of of uh, interpreting the Great Commission as a responsibility to carry the gospel to each and every people group. You know, I think that's just a a, a, a seriously flawed uh, interpretation of the Great Commission. Uh, and I, I think. I just well, and it's that. it's a popular it's a popular uh, thing. So I uh, guess if you just graze past it, people are probably going to be like, "Hey." <laughs> yeah, it, it sounds a little unjustified, you know. So I have some some regrets, but I hope to you know maybe write some stuff in the future to kind of balance mm -hmm. it out. But I I think if some if a young person is really wrestling with you know should I be a missionary should I not be a missionary mm -hmm. hopefully this will give them some you know categories uh to to think mm -hmm. hopefully more wisely about that question I hope yeah no absolutely and and I I totally agree and I highly recommend it if you guys go on Amazon search send me I'll go by Jake Tobby um find it and uh help them out you know, buy it, read it. Uh, it'll definitely be worth your while. And we'll be talking a little bit about it uh, in the show today. Now, Jake has a really awesome story. And rather than just like letting him tell his testimony at the beginning of the show and then getting into our topic in the second half, like we typically do, um, what I would rather do is get into the topic and then let Jake's story and experiences kind of uh, guide the conversation. I kind of picked these themes for Jake because we're going to be talking today about the call to missions and the cost of missions. And I think those two uh, things um, can really talk about his story a lot and, and some of the stuff he talks about in the book. So we talked about the fact that you were a missionary to China for seven years. Uh, you're now in Taiwan. Um, what happened? Mm. Why aren't you in China anymore? Yeah. And why are you in Taiwan? Well, uh, Really, it actually happened <clears throat> somewhere between my writing that book, which is interesting because, you know, I, I think I do say, you know, talk a big game maybe in the book about being willing to pay a price. And there's a cost that comes that we have to be prepared to pay if we're going to be involved in missions. And then kind of a, in a situation where I had to put my money where my mouth was uh, about a year later, we were back. We had uh, just transitioned back to China from a short time in the States. And... Um, uh, we were, um, we were essentially, we were picked up by the police there. We had, um, it was on an Easter Sunday morning. So I guess, let's see, uh, probably six years ago, this, okay. this Easter, six years ago, Easter Sunday. And, uh, we had several churches that were been planted there in Harveen where we were working and police, uh, kind of showed a coordinated sort mm -hmm. of invasion and hit all, all the churches at once. And, <clears throat> and so the, the, the out, you know, the outcome of that was we had, uh, I was given 10 days to leave the country and a ban that would last for uh, five years. Mm. Or they said it would be at least five years. So obviously five years has passed and I've, I've applied to try to get back into China since then. I haven't been allowed to go, uh, go back in. So mm. that was obviously a huge heartbreak for us to have to leave, to leave China. Um, we loved the work there and we still love the work. We're still involved there as, uh, in, in the ways that we're able to be. Um, but leaving was, was, you know, that was a really heartbreaking thing. And we ended up in Taiwan because after you leave China, it's like, okay, uh, who else speaks China, Chinese? You know? <laughs> sure. Mandarin. And, and Taiwan was pretty obvious fit for us. And they're, are they more open or more lenient, I suppose, to Christians? Oh, yeah. I mean, Taiwan would, would pride itself on being, on enjoying all the uh, freedoms of a, you know, modern liberal de democracy. <clears throat> so, uh, we're, we're able to pretty much act as missionaries here without any, you know, pretense or any. So you know, what's the juxtaposition between the ministry that you had in China versus what you have now? Are they completely opposite? 
it's really, it was really weird. Uh, it's, it was, a, it was an adjustment, you know? Um, and in some ways it was weird. You know, we came here and we thought like, um, Oh, this is going to be so easy. It's like, we're used to doing things in China where we're not allowed, like our hands are tied behind our back. A lot, there's a lot of things we'd like to do, but probably can't do. Mm-hmm. And now we're in Taiwan, totally free. We can do whatever we want to do. Um, uh, but it's not quite as simple as that. You know, obviously the most important thing uh, for us as missionaries in our work is uh, the work of the Holy Spirit as he uh, chooses and as he works and as he draws people. And so um, it wasn't as simple as like, oh, it's a free country, so ministry will be easier. Oh, like, well, there's there's strong hold of idolatry here in Taiwan and superstition and materialism. So it's not like, oh, China, hard. Taiwan easy, you know, there's mm-hmm. a new set of challenges. And if anything's been surprised me, it's been how different the two, the two contexts. Have been. I mean, on, on paper, you would think, okay, the same culture, kind of the same language, you know, uh, this should be, you know, same historical background, you know, it should be, mm-hmm. should be the same, same kind of deal. But um, no, it's, it's been, it's been surprising to us how, how different it's been. Wow. And so talking about, uh, I guess, getting into this idea of the cost of missions, um, I mean, really, you guys counted the cost of having to do missions in a country that's closed, where you're doing things under the radar, underground type churches, um, and then the cost ended up being uh, getting expelled from the country. So if, if you were talking to a young man or young lady who's uh, praying about going to the mission field anywhere, anywhere in the world, and they're just having a hard time, you talk a, a lot about this in the book kind of throughout what would some of your advice be in getting them to count those costs and is it worth it? Um, well, I don't think that, uh, uh, everybody has to be willing to pay, um, every cost. Of course, as, as believers, um, we need to be willing to, we need to learn to count the cost, but that's the thing. There's, there's probably lots of costs that I'm not, I'm not yet spiritually prepared to pay. I hope that as my, uh, walk with Christ continues, uh, that, you know, eventually I'll be willing to pay more, the, even the ultimate cost if need be, but I, I can't say I've never been in that position. So I can't say for sure that I'm, I'm ready to pay it. But, um, in most fields, there's certain things that we can look at and say, if you're not willing to pay this cost, then probably maybe that's not the mission field for you. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, in China, there is a very, if, if you're a missionary in China, there is a very, significant chance if you're doing anything at all uh, if you're involved in church ministry if you're involved in evangelism there's a very real possibility that you're ultimately going to be thrown in a van by the police interrogated and you're going to be uh you're going to be kicked out of the country Mm. Uh, and if you're not if that sounds too scary to you or you say i'm not willing to pay that price well that's a good that's a good reason it's not a good reason to go and be a scared missionary. That's a good reason not go, not to go as a missionary mm. to that to that field. You know, sure. um, so yeah, I, I think that tells us. It tell, I mean, it tells me. I think we need to work to make sure that uh, you know our willingness to pay a cost is a is a mm-hmm. spiritual issue. It's an it's an area of our uh, sanctification of our uh, love for Christ and our commitment to obeying Him. And so yeah, we need to make sure missionaries are not just nice, willing people who are, you know, talented or skilled or willing to go live in another place, but they're willing to pay the costs associated mm-hmm. with that particular field. Yeah. And it, biblically, you know, God tells us in, in the Gospels, no man builds a tower, you know, without considering the cost and whether he'd be able to finish it. And, and I think that's fair. But it's when I think of counting the cost of, of missions, or even let's just say being a disciple, regardless of your geographic location today in 2020 and living in America and Western society, I feel like so much of the time it's, it's, are you willing to count the cost of giving up the luxuries of Western society to go somewhere that's by the way, is probably pretty luxurious compared to 50 or a hundred years ago, but just not what you're used to. So what are, what are some of the costs that, um, generally a Christian needs to count if he's thinking about doing missions and it, would you say comfort is a, is a big one? Huge one. Yeah. I mean, and there's, there's the comforts are all, they're not just creature comforts either. They're the comforts of family. And you know, oh, it yeah. was easy sure. to wife and I kind of discount that before we had kids. Now we've got kids and it's like, yeah, we think about it all the time. Oh, our kids, they don't, they barely know their cousins. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they see their grand, they might see their grandparents once a year. Yeah. Uh, you know, the kids are growing up in a in a place where they're outsiders and they stick out, and so you you feel it more for your kids, I think. And I I guess I didn't probably understand that when you were uh, a younger man. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I don't think I understood that as well. That's definitely part of it. Um, but I would say a huge. I was just reflecting on this yesterday. Acts chapter five, where the apostles are beaten and they rejoice that they're counted worthy to suffer for the sake of Christ's name. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that uh, one of the things you experience when you're being, you know, persecuted or you know arrested or being uh, expelled from a country is this loss of honor, this feeling of, of shame. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't you know, like a uh, a young man prideful badge of honor to you, like you you would imagine it as a seventeen year old or something. Yeah, I think it was when I got back to the States and people were making a big deal out of it, treating mm -hmm. it like it was a heroic thing. <laughs> sure. When you're there and you have police officers rummaging through your house mm -hmm. and just taking stuff and um, uh, detaining you and your family and not having freedom. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, it, it was a it was a it, it's a shameful thing. It's a shameful thing to be. Um, put into custody with police officers, with neighbors standing around gawking. But that, that shame, I was thinking, I was read of that in Acts 5 yesterday, like that, that shame is something that all missionaries understand, that loss of honor, mm -hmm. something that all missionaries will have to face to a certain extent. You all, we all face the possibility of being mocked, of being rejected, of being um, uh, people having prejudice against us for being foreigners or for mm -hmm. the funny way that we talk or, or um, there's, there's a, there's a hundred ways that we lose face, that we feel shame um, hmm. when we're serving as missionaries. And that's what you're right. It's all the cost. We have to be prepared to pay all that. Sure, man, that, that's really good. And, and so, you know, lack of amenities, missing your family. I mean, all of those things are, are costs that, that are worthy of considering um, because I, I do feel like we're going to see the flip side of the coin here is what I want to ultimately get to. But I do feel like sometimes um, if you go to a good church and they do miss, and and I know from your book and what you've said, you went to a good church that emphasized missions and sent families. Um, same, I, I'm from a church like that, and I know a lot of the people who listen to this are in churches that love missions and love missionaries. You you might have a tendency to grow up romanticizing it a little bit, not the mission, but being being a missionary. You might romanticize it a little bit, and and the reality is it's hard. You know, not not to like like you said, not making a hero of missionaries, as but I mean. It, it, missionaries are heroes. Um, you don't have to say it about yourself. I'm not on the field yet, so I can say it. Um, <laughs> but, but with that being said though, um, you know, some things are harder than others. Some, uh, fields are different than other. I think pastor Jeff, my pastor always says that not all field, all fields are not created equal. And I think that's absolutely true. Uh, but counting all the costs aside, um, I think I know the answer to this question, but is it worth it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It is. Um, I haven't always felt like it was. Um, I've had uh, um, times of, of, of doubt and being really conflicted. And um, there's been times where I, I, I said all the right stuff and I, I try to sound like a like a Christian should sound when they're going through something like that. Um, uh, but there, you know, a lot of times some, some of that stress was internalized and directed at family and um, some of it had really unhealthy expressions like I think you know my family was they're pretty um, scarred a little bit by that experience of being kicked out of China it was mm. a pretty especially my wife it was a pretty startling and uh, it's kind of a scary thing to go through and but I was like just desperate to get back on the mission field and so we moved to Taiwan just a few months after that happened and oh it was that quick of a turnaround yeah it was wow. real it was fast because I was just desperate to get back to Asia and get back to our work. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I think, I, you know, I think that hurt my family. And part of that was, um, you know, part of that was not responding to, to suffering in a, in a correct way, not realizing that, um, that it's, that it's worth it. Not, not, mm -hmm. you know, realizing. you know, there in Acts five again, where he says, you know, they rejoice that they were counted worthy. Mm -hmm. In other words, when you're losing honor as a missionary, that's because God is honoring you. Hmm. He's honoring us by allowing us to be associated with the name of Christ. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not, not only not worthy to be associated with Christ, I'm not even worthy to, to suffer hmm. in his name. I'm not worthy to do anything in his name. So that anybody would connect my name with the name of Christ, uh, whether it's on a police document or whatever, is hmm. just uh, is, is, a, is a 
is something that we're not uh, we're not worthy for. And Christ promises repeatedly in the Gospels that um, God is no man's debtor, mm. and there is no one who has suffered the loss of anything that will not be repaid a hundred times over. And so we need to somehow, you know, it's difficult. I'm not sure the perfect answer to it, but we we do need to learn to um, count ourselves blessed um, mm. there with the apostles. Do you find um, when you're going through those hard times of whatever they may be, uh, just the hardships of being on a foreign field, um, you, you talk about in your book that uh, when you're counting the cost and, and realizing that it is worth it, that that we have to shift our perspective to the long term instead of the short term, because in the short term, it's not always worth it. <laughs> you know, there might be some like short term gratifying, joyous times when someone comes to the Lord, when you see a church plant, baptized believer, whatever. Um, but do you find yourself having to shift your perspective when you're going through those times? Be like, man, I got I got to remember the long term goal of this thing or or the long term eternal rewards. Right, right. Well, absolutely. Because um, I would say, pro- and this is, I try to do this in the book. I don't know if I, if I succeed at it, but you know, what I'm trying to, one of the things I want us to see is if we just paint the, the glory of missions or even the need of missions as just like people need the Lord and there's people out there, they're lost and they're without Christ and God is not willing that a nation perish. And so he sent us out on a rescue mission. So in other words, if we use the divine rescue mission mentality about mission only that and of course that's that's scriptural but if that's the only category we have for thinking about missions then we'll start to we don't have a category for well, what do you make of a missionary who's working in a field that's yielding very very little fruit hmm. and he may be preaching the gospel you know he may be preaching his heart out he may be working harder than any missionary in the world, some missionaries working in a much more high fruit yielding context. Sure, sure. Uh, but he's one of those missionaries that God has seen fit to let him go years with very little fruit. And that's another been a part of the challenge moving to Taiwan. Like we've seen far less fruit um, uh, here in Taiwan than we saw uh, working in China, even though it's freer, mm-hmm. uh, you know, more more free place. And so I think, especially in those moments, uh, we have to have a what you call a long term. Uh, perspective, or at least a perspective that's beyond just like, if a missionary has gone into it, defined as like, I'm a rescue worker, I rescue people. Okay, well, what are you going to do? And nobody's, you know, nobody's getting on your life raft. Mm. Are you, uh, are you just going to like, what, are you going to start feeling self pity? Are you going to start feeling like a failure? Sure. Like you're not sure. Doing or, or do you, have especially with that Western results driven oh, mindset? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So and we got to have a different, like another like another way of thinking about our faithfulness as missionaries. Mm -hmm. Well, it kind of reminds me of uh, uh, some of the missionaries of antiquity, you know, Philadelphian church age guys who went to till the field in in a hard place and Mm -hmm. saw virtually no fruit in their lifetime. Um, But we know that they were able to plant the seeds that other men were able to build upon. And of course we know in hindsight that they, they have amazing fruit that remains and and we'll see that in heaven. But, um, but I can imagine that that would be really hard in the moment. <laughs> yeah. That's what, you know, that's one of the things I think we should, as, as, as the church that we should be learning through this entire, for this, you know, this coronavirus thing that the world has experienced. Um, one of the, one of the things that we should probably take away from that is that um, God has a way of what looks to us like upsetting the game board, uh, just knocking all the pieces everywhere. And we're like, Dude, we were in the middle of doing something important. <laughs> and it's like, we don't have any idea. You know, like you said about God may be setting the stage. And it, when, when we see God clearing the stage as he's doing right now uh, through this epidemic, you know, we, God's got the, the end game in mind and he's setting things up. Uh, who knows? You know, we look back now, 100 years from now and say, uh, we'll see a thousand blessings that came because of this hmm. mess that we're going through right now. Sure. That's awesome. Well, I do want to shift us to um, the calling of missions. Uh, Certainly, if anyone's listening to this, they've heard someone say something to the effect of, I was called to preach when I was this age, or I really felt God calling me to missions at this point in my life or at this missions conference or what have you. Um, In your book, you talk a lot about this. Really, uh, there's an entire chapter about this, and I I think it's important. but what I want to start with with you is where do we get this mysterious quote unquote call to missions that everyone talks about but has a hard time defining? 
Yeah, I think it's related to the overall question of, of Christian guidance. And, you know, I've tried to do a little research on it and read a few, um, you know, Christian thinkers and authors about, you know, where, where why do we believe there's this uh, level of guidance? And, you know, there's a few verses in the New Testament that talk, for example, about um, how we're led by the Spirit, as we as the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. Uh, but, um, you know, there's, there, it, it seems very unlikely that any of those passages are talking about what we might call uh, personal, what we might call personal guidance or life direction or something like that. Uh, you know, in other words, like uh, when we think of guidance, maybe we think like, OK, I've got to decide who I'm going to marry, uh, mm-hmm. where I'm going to live, uh, what, what I'm going to do for a living. Mm-hmm. And we, we kind of think that, you know, I've got a choice between, oh, do I go to college A or do I go to college B? Right. But the right, that the right way for Christians to make that choice is to be sensitive to some sort of inner leading. Mm-hmm. And I, I, um, I'm, I'm not the only one who thinks this, I don't think, but I just, I just think that's a really uh, poor way. That's, that's not um, exactly the Christian way to, that we're supposed to approach decision making. There are ways that Christians are supposed to think through our decisions and make decisions. And Do you I think the reason is it just down downplays uh, the role of Scripture in in a in a Christian's life? Man, I hope not, but I'm afraid I'm afraid you're probably right in a lot of in a lot of cases because we don't know Scripture, mm. we, we really can't rely on it, and so we're left. Um, yeah. not, but I think one of the biggest things is a desire to evade responsibility. Mm. It's like uh, I want to be. I want to. I want to guarantee that the choice I make is going to have is going to be safe. Yeah. And uh, I've made plenty of decisions like this in my past. Uh, I remember facing a very large, a very big decision. Uh, I had a friend who was encouraging, encouraging me to go to Peru and train with this missionary Mm -hmm. uh, down there. And I, so man, I just, I agonized over that decision. And then I thought, well, I need to let God make this decision for me. And so I just, I determined I'm going to wait until I get some sort of word from the Lord about this. Mm -hmm. And what it really was, was me just psyching myself up psychologically to do it and just trying to, I was afraid that if I went down there, something really bad was going to happen. But I felt like, if, if, well, if God would tell me, then uh, at least it wouldn't be my fault. Whatever happens down there is, you know, mm. it's not my fault. It's God, God led me into it, which is a good thing that Christians want. What Christians want to know is God's got me. He's got the future. Sure, sure. Uh, he's leading me. He's in control. Like, those are all admirable, good things that we want to encourage Christians to think, but but it's wrong for Christians to say, well, if I go to college A, God is going to be with me. But if I go to college B, mm-hmm. I've gotten off the yellow brick road of God's will. And now right. the rest of my life is like, I've already missed out on God's best. And from here on out, it's like every yeah. wrong decision you make, I'm like, you know. Well, and that's work. coming at it from a uh, expecting the best in people, too, and thinking that they're really being sincere. But, man, I'm, I come from 10 years of youth ministry experience and hearing what you just said constantly is kids that I love and grow up in church and you teach them about, uh, I think you're kind of alluding to the, you know, the, the will of God versus the plan of God. That's something you talk with youth about all the time. We've got the will of God in his word, but the plan of God for your life, man, that comes from extrapolating his will and, and, and being obedient to him and walking in the spirit every day and, and letting him guide your steps, you know, Proverbs three, five and six. Um, but you know, so they go through all that and you disciple them and do all these things. And then they're 18 and, and then they're like, well, God told me I'm going to Ohio State. And you're like, oh, well, I, I guess I can't say anything then because God told you, right? Trump, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you even get to in your book, um, you, you mentioned at one point that uh, this elusive call, quote, quote unquote, that we think we're looking for to help us maybe be called into missions can actually aid in young people not surrendering to missions more often than it does the other thing. Absolutely. Because it's like a big cop out. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're like, if you're going to leave it up to mystical, personal, subjective feeling, uh, like what I've noticed in my own life is when I have these quote leadings, mm-hmm. uh, it's, 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 it's a little suspicious because I generally <laughs> felt led to do what I pretty much want to do. <laughs> That's not you sound like that. every, every teenager that I've ever <laughs> led in youth ministry is, yeah. you know, it's funny that God's voice sounds a lot like what I <laughs> want to do. <laughs> right. now, to their credit, I have met believers who have followed what they believe to be God's leading in their life to do something that they didn't really want to do. But I would argue even in those situations that those mature believers 
they were wrestling between what they wanted in their flesh to do and what they truly believed God's word mm. would all the kind of person that God's word was calling them to be. It wasn't like a, a strict, like a coin toss sure. between you know morally equal um, options. Um, so mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's a co- because it is very, very unlikely that you're going to have that you in your deepest, like, you know, subconscious, you know, personal mm-hmm. feeling about the matter that you're going to be like, you know what, I think I really want to move to a country on the other side of the world and learn a hard language <laughs> and this work that nope, that's not going to be uh, very fun sometimes. Like that's it's very, unless you grew up in an environment that glorifies that sort of Sure. Uh, Which know, is the minority typically. Right. Right. I think mm-hmm. you and I are probably from kind of that sort of a background. And sure. It's possible you get teenagers, but even there, we don't, we really don't want, I get worried if I see a teenager, that's kind of what's leading them into missions. It's like, cause that's not going to feed your soul for the next 35 years. It's like, sure. you're going to run out. And so we need to somewhere. And I think most people eventually do, they dig down and they find something mm. more concrete than that. Yeah. When they're at the crossroads, it's it's really like this, you know, psychological coin toss about where you're gonna go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. And and I also I want to be clear to anyone who's listening, by the way, that like I'm not trying to build this like straw man uh, against uh, a quote unquote call from God because the Bible does talk about different callings. Um that, you know, God calls all men to repentance and to believe the gospel and to be saved. You know, I, it's John 12. Jesus says, you know, if I be lifted up, um, you know, I will, you know, bring, draw all men to me. So God does call men. And uh, even um, I think the one that I go to the most when it comes to missions uh, is Acts 13. Uh, Jeff showed me this years ago when I was a younger man um, in Acts 13 at the beginning when uh, the Holy Spirit says to the church, separate me Barnabas and, and Paul for the work that I've called them to. And usually the, the line that Jeff has used and I would use in that situation, because most um, younger people, when they're wrestling with, where, do they want to surrender their lives to missions? It's more about the where. And what yeah. we find there is God calling ba- Paul and Barnabas to be separated to the work that he's mm. called them to. So God most certainly calls us to a work and uh, and certainly our experiences, our shape, our our abilities, and our preparedness, which I'm sure we'll get to in a little bit here, lends yeah. itself to what God may uh, have for you to do. Uh, but this idea, what we're getting to, is this idea that only a few special people are called to be missionaries. Th- that's really the, the heart of the issue. It's not that God doesn't call people. It's this weird thing that, well, you know, I really would love to, Brother Jake— go to missions, but God hasn't called me. Right. Yeah. It's like this thing. And I, again, like you said, like, we don't want to say to people, if you have had, you know, what you believe to be this strong sense of personal leading or guidance, and you really, you have that distinct calling experience, like, hey, that's wonderful. I don't want to knock that at all. What I want to, the person I want to talk to is the person who says what you exactly what you just said, who says, yeah, I mean, I see missions would be a great thing for me to do in my life. I just don't feel called to do that or mm-hmm. i don't feel like i've gotten the divine permission slip to go ahead right you know i love to do it. i just need god to sign and then i would be willing to do it. it's like it's me that wants to it's god that doesn't want me to mm-hmm. and I, I think that's really unfortunate because ultimately what it leads to is a lot of the people that we should be um encouraging to think about missions like you said we have we kind of we feel like our hands are tied a little bit mm-hmm. and, and i see this regularly even at the highest levels of missions recruitment all of our efforts are sort of um, um, hamstrung a little bit because you'll have a guy who give a, and deliver a passionate address about the need of the world and the need for missionaries and all this. But at the end, there's always this clause that's like, um, of course, God doesn't call everybody to do this. Right, okay. right. It's, it's the cop out clause. <laughs> right. And they're like, well, I, I haven't had that experience, so therefore I must not be. So, yeah. you know. I, as a missionary, I try I try to draw attention away from the specifics of what got me into missions because I want to say, if you're desirous of this work, as you you know you talk about being for this work, if you're desirous of this work, it's a good work that you desire. And um, unless the reasons that your church sees for you not to be involved in missions, then you are more than um, welcome to begin pursuing that 
um, in wise ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, even, I mean, Paul says in to Timothy that, you know, to desire the work of a bishop is, is a good thing. And, uh, you know, a bishop, I mean, if you're going to go be a missionary, I mean, you know, we, people could argue about, you know, different facets of missions and that's all fine and dandy, but you're going to be shepherding believers um, to some extent. And so you need to prepare. Uh, I do want to read a quote from, from your book just while we're on this subject here, because I, I love, I actually laughed out loud when I, when I read this quote, I highlighted it in here. It says, uh, it, it's, it's time for, I'm paraphrasing the beginning here. It's time for us to stop saying things like, well, we can't all go to the mission field. We're so far from that extreme that the very suggestion that this is a danger we are likely to face is laughable. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's the thing though is, well, we can't all go to the field. Well, that's a good point. We, because we are in this dangerous time where 95% of the church wants to go to the mission field, right? What are we going to do when everyone... No, my goodness. Come on. How about we start thinking about it the other way that uh, right. you say somewhere else that, you know, we act, we need more manpower than we need money right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That is very different from the perception. Uh, you know, there's all this uh, brainstorming and all these ridiculous efforts that are being made to try to fix the problem of money and missions. Mm -hmm. and that's just really not the hang up right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a money problem. As far as I know, we don't have a money problem uh, in missions. Yeah. Uh, what we have is uh, a lack of Now, one of the things I think I've changed about in my, in my thoughts about uh, missions recruiting since, since I, wrote, I wrote the book, I think is, you know, uh, I want to be careful. We don't need one of the problems I think in recruiting ironically is that we make it sound like we need too many workers. Um, we make it sound like we need, you know, you know, uh, innumerable workers. And it's really, it's really not the case. Uh, that comes from, um, you just mentioned the fact that, you know, missionaries may be doing different, uh, different things. And, uh, ironically, the reason that we feel that we need so many missionaries, like, like a ridiculous number. We need millions and millions of missionaries. The reason that people make it sound like that is because we have such indefinite goals for missionaries. We don't have any expectations of missionaries. Missionaries can be doing anything from putting a roof on a house to digging a well to, you know, administering medicine to sick people mm -hmm. to planning a church. And so if you say, well, how many missionaries do we need around the world? Well, the answer is if they're doing that many different kinds of thing, like, well, of course the answer is, we need an, an infinite number of missionaries. Mm. They're never going to run out of work. But if you have a more narrow definition of the mission, as I think we would, um, a more great commission centric definition of missions, well, then we meet, we need a much smaller number of mm. people who are going to be involved in preaching the gospel and planning churches and speaking the language. Like, uh, what, what, then the number of missionaries we need all of a sudden just drastically. We do not need everybody to be mm -hmm. uh, a missionary. And that, but then at the same time, we're also not in danger of everyone leaving the states to be missionaries. So, so that that doesn't need to be something that hangs you up, right? Right. Yeah. What, what, I, what bothers me the most right now about our general recruitment strategy is like because of that, because of that sort of like nebulous idea about what the work of missions is. Mm -hmm. If you get on the average like mission agency's website and you look for like the areas where they're looking for where they're looking to recruit people. What you'll find is like they're recruiting like they want everybody to consider mm. being a missionary. You know, if you're if you're a retiree, you know, if you're 65 and you're, you're retired and, uh, you know, you're interested, they, they want you to think about being a missionary. I'm all I'm fine. I have no problem. I don't want to say clearly, I don't have any problem with retirees being missionaries. But like that is not where we should be feeling the weight of missions. We mm. should like if you're in your early 20s and you love the Lord, and you care about evangelism, and you care about missions, mm -hmm. then like, you need to be thinking very strong. What right. is believable to me is that that kind of person I just described, 90, uh, 95 out of 100 of them are not pursuing missions. Hmm. And would you say it's because of that elusive, man, I just don't feel like God has called me, or he hasn't called me yet? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's half of it, and the other half of it is... Uh, I think a lot of our potential missionaries are pursuing pastoral and church planning ministry in the U S mm -hmm. um, I think you see all these guys who are going to seminaries and pursuing church planning and uh, pastoring in the States. It's like those guys are our best candidates. So what we have is like right now we're trying to find all the guys who are doing, who are like backpackers and mountain climbers and stuff, which is <laughs> great for all that. And we're trying to send them like, 
oh, you like adventure, you should be a missionary. No, what we need to do is go into the libraries of the seminaries and say, oh, you guys like preaching and you like theology, mm. like the, you love yeah. the church. You should be a missionary. We have enough men. I, I lost my mind a couple of years ago. There was a there was a uh, article. I think it was on Christianity Today or one of these larger Christian media outlets, and it was about how all these seminary graduates can't find work at churches in the United States. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow. and that no one puts two and two together and say, yeah. well, these people should be going to another another place. Right. No, you're absolutely right, and it's it's kind of this whole idea of. Um, well, you even mentioned this in the, in your book and tell some stories. There's often a stigma of what, who are the missionaries? Well, it's not the people who want to study the Bible and, and preach the word. It's people who like adventure or, or who are good with their hands or what, whatever. Like it's, it, there's this stigma that like, I, I think it was more, you know, decades past. I think today there's less of a stigma, but there has been a stigma in the past that missionaries aren't the, uh, the most Bible literate Bible preachers. Um, and, and luckily I think that's changing for the better, but like you said, it's, it's really churches should be sending their best because yeah. if you can't cut it in ministry here in the culture you grew up in, in the language that you speak with people, you know, how are you magically just going to be great at it going across the world to a, a foreign culture and a foreign language that you don't know? Yeah, it, no doubt. It's like Absolutely. we're setting our kids up for failure and, and uh, it's not even yeah. their fault sometimes. Yeah. Um, you know, it's been said before, Jake, I'm sure you've heard this, you know, a, a call to ministry or a call to missions is a call to prepare. Um, you know, we've all uh, we've all been commanded to go and well, we've all been commanded to participate in the Great Commission, um, but we're not all qualified uh, at any given time to necessarily go participate in that ministry. We know that there's qualifications, there's character qualities of a, of a minister listed in Timothy and in Titus. Um, so just because God gives us that great commission doesn't mean, okay, disregard what your church leadership says and go, you know, we obviously you have that authority structure of the local church and, um, but, but is it possible, you know, it's kind of stemming from this idea that like, you know, maybe not as few people are, as called as we used to think, is it possible that God will call anyone who will simply obey him and prepare themselves to be used by him? I, I, I think so. Absolutely. I, I yeah. know that's kind of a nebulous thing, but it's, yeah. I don't know. I, I wouldn't want to limit it. Yeah. I would never want to limit like our missionary ranks to, um, uh, you know, just to younger people. I've met missionaries who are far more faithful than I am and far more fruitful. And I think far more godly than myself who, uh, got into missions when they were in their thirties or in their forties. And so I thank God for every one of them. All I can mm -hmm. say is for myself, I am so grateful that I spent my twenties on the mission field where I learned, I made so many mistakes and I grew so much and I learned, I was able to learn Chinese when I was young. I, it's hard for me to imagine learning Chinese right now. Oh, um, sure. Sure. You know? So I'm really thankful for that. But, but though, of course, yeah, I, I you know, I, I would praise the Lord for anybody who's willing to do that. What I would want to push against is, is uh, sort of the warm bodies approach, which is just like, we just need mm -hmm. manpower on the field. And so what, what we're more, most interested is in is interest. Like, okay, question one, are you interested in going? Okay, <laughs> great. You're, you're on board. Number two, what can you do? <laughs> sure. And that to me is so backwards. Instead, we should be looking at people who have already shown, like you said, already shown that they, um, are uh, you know, practice disciple makers that they can handle the word of truth that they um, uh, that they are theologically grounded that they're committed to the church and say and that who know how to preach and, uh, and want to say well you know uh, what's keeping you from taking what you've learned and taking it to another place and maybe just learning learning a language I really think part of it comes down to people thinking that they could never uh, they can't hardly imagine themselves. And part of this is maybe us being uh, Americans and not being super comfortable interacting with our cultures. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I think it's really, really hard for some of the people that I've talked to for them to imagine themselves doing all the things they love to do in mm. Portuguese or in Thai or in Japanese. Yeah. Like, I love the church. I love preaching the word. I love teaching people. I love making disciples. I love all that. I just can't imagine myself doing that in Japanese. And yeah. so they, if I was a missionary, well, I'd have to be like basically painting walls and driving vehicles and, uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and, 
and preparing meals and and just basically being uh, being in some doing something besides the kind of ministry that they really love doing. Yeah, and and to your point, a couple of quotes from your book that I that I think is really good because um, I think that American teenagers and young adults that. Um, hear churches talk about missions, but then immediately count themselves out. Uh, you, you made a couple good points that I really liked. Um, and one of the quotes that you've got in here says, though most believers may agree that the unreached condition of hundreds of millions around the world is outrageous and unacceptable, they will assume that God wants them to remain where they are unless they receive some sort of divine confirmation that they are one of the special few who should go. And so not only do they limit themselves, you know, it, it's almost like... Uh, <laughs> like it's it's almost spiritualized like it's a cop out but they're like well but you know god didn't call me and if if god really wanted me to go he would call me um right. but an, another thing that you say in here is that one of the greatest reservations young believers have about going into missions is that they don't desire such a life as much as they desire to work in business or live in america or some th- some other thing it kind of goes back to what we were saying is it is it possible that we just love this world more than we love the calling that God's given us. And that, that first John two, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life has given us this American dream of what my life needs to look like. And we just need to count the cost and, and decide, am I willing to give that up for the sake of the call of Christ? Yeah. I, I think that's, that's a huge part. Let me, let me riff off something you said about the spiritualizing thing, because I think missionaries can actually hurt that part of the process as well. Mm-hmm. By being, over spiritualizing um what they're actually doing or what their life actually works so like when i was before when i was just interested in being a, a missionary the thing that really kept me from acting on that desire was that i had no idea at all anything about mission i didn't know how missionaries trained mm-hmm. i didn't know what missionaries did on the field from day to day Mm-hmm. I didn't know where missionaries' money came from. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't understand it. Like, I didn't know, where do you get your money if you're a missionary? Yeah. And it, there's sometimes, you know, missionaries, understandably, we have a little bit of embarrassment maybe of talking, you know, plainly about finances and stuff like that. But um, it's funny that once you sort of remove that, I've tried the best I can to be really candid with young people about how missionary support works and, um, and uh, we kind of work that you need to be prepared to do what our average life, what our, you know, our daily life looks like. And one of the reasons I'm trying to be real candid about that is to remove some of that kind of spiritual fog around it so mm-hmm. that they can see like, uh, and this is not an area where, you know, they need to just take a leap of faith. This is something where there, there's enough, there's enough challenge to the mission field that we don't need to add in these further challenges of like mystery and you don't know what's coming around the next corner. We should be able to articulate for young people like, Here's a very clear path. And in my experience, churches that lay out a really clear path to the mission field, mm-hmm. not surprisingly, they generally, they do two things. If they remove the mystique around the call, and if they remove the mystique around the process, they're going to find a lot more people from their church heading toward the mission field. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I like what you said there about like some things are just, even even if not spiritualized, just mysterious. Like, what do missionaries do all day? How do they raise money? Like, I've had uh, some young people, while I've been on deputation, uh, we're, we're near the end of that and are, you know, preparing the logistics during this pandemic world of trying to move. But, you know, a lot of young kids who are interested, they're just like, so how do you do deputation? And I'm like, well, you know, to tell you the truth, uh, I've had to wing it and and pick my pastor's brain who used to be a missionary and and you know let me and so i've been like writing down my thoughts so that i can give them kind of some bullet points for some kids in the future who want help with that just because why does it need to be mysterious why can't we just tell kids hey you know this isn't the only way to do it but start here give this a try um basically what it comes down to is you need churches and individuals to pledge to give you money uh every month infinitely or indefinitely i should say and uh, yeah. you got to figure out a way to partner with the Lord to figure out how that's going to happen. And it's not that mysterious. <laughs> right. Right. If you do that, I think probably, I mean, part of it is like, I think we're afraid of like, we're going to make missions so um, appealing that people are going to be, you know, joining up with missions for the wrong reasons. Like, mm. dude, support raising is hard enough. Oh my goodness. Uh, it's, it's, it's like, it's hard enough that we don't need to make it harder by making it mysterious. Right. It's already bad enough, uh, tough enough. Yeah that it will discourage, you know, people who are just trying to get a handout uh, right. who aren't serious about doing the work, you know. We yeah, and need- if you've over-romanticized the mission field in your head somehow, like, 
you know, all these uh, travel bloggers and vloggers on Instagram and whatever the kids do these days. I'm, I'm turning into an old curmudgeon. Uh, but, they, you know, you see all that kind of stuff. Like, oh, I could be a missionary. This would be exotic and fun and adventurous. Uh, well, you know, six months into deputation, that's that's going to hit the fan and you're going to be like, what what have I done? Uh, if you yeah. do, if you don't have a realistic uh, uh, expectation, right? Uh, absolutely, yeah. and like, and that probably shows that the best the best thing that we can do, or if, if a church is desirous of doing more for missions and having more of their members go as missionaries, mm-hmm. there is nothing better that you can do than to regularly take people from your church to the mission field, not just to any mission field, but to a missionary who will be candid with them mm-hmm. about mission field and we'll try not just to put them to work doing something to make them feel good mm-hmm. you know running a bbs or painting something but making them uh having a real conversation with them about what a missionary's work and mission is mm-hmm. and if, if a church will do that you know they're going to see they start again removing some of that mystique it will discourage you know, you're absolutely right that will in itself that exposure to the realities of the mission field will discourage a lot of the people whose motives are not, um, or sure. whose motives are suspect. But for those who, you know, uh, are already desirous of serving Christ, like they, they're going to, a lot of them are going to see in mission something that they want to pursue and something that a place where they want to serve the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. Would you, uh, recommend if someone is interested in, uh, pursuing, you know, full-time foreign missions, um, to do a more extended stay or internship rather than just their one, two week trips that they've done in the past, do like a three or six month or 12 month internship with a, with a missionary your church is comfortable with just to, to get past that. Uh, I've got a ticket home feeling. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there may be other ways of doing it. I think there's people who've probably tried to um, replicate that experience um, back home. Uh, but Probably the, there's probably no easier way to do it than to actually introduce um, a young person into the mission field. And I've seen both happen. I've seen lots of people who come and go through an internship uh, here or in other places. And by the time they finish, um, they've got their sort of understanding of missions is hammered out and their understanding of their own challenge, how they personally or how their family responds to the challenge of missions. That's kind of they've kind of got a grasp on that. They've started to learn. Okay, how do we learn a language? How do we actually do things and missions? They've got all they've got kind of that figured out. And so they they're ready to enter the next step. And several mm-hmm. of them have left here and gone back and started support raising right away. On the other hand, we've had people go through the same process and they've attained the same understanding. They've said, Yeah, I don't think this is probably where where uh, we're gonna serve. But, which but, uh, which is probably a lot better than going through two or three years of deputation and then a year of depression on the field to then come home and have to tell all these churches it didn't work out. Like, figure that out on an internship, right? Yes. yes. Uh, those questions can be answered in much less pain. And, you know, the good thing about an internship like that is one of the, one of my um, kind of drums I, I want to keep beating all the time is that missions, what, what missions ministry is, is not radically different from uh from ministry back home Amen. what the work, the work that we're doing overseas and this is a, this is a hang up a lot of people have this big separation in our mind between like in the states we're doing this one kind of work but overseas we're doing uh, this other kind of work yeah that's what makes that good is that means an internship is a safe bet for any young person who's desirous of serving christ it's like i think we've had interns who have come here who have learned with us for six months or a year and they've gone back to the states and they have been more i hope have been more effective disciple makers, mm. more um, influential Christians in their church, better leaders in their church, better, more faithful servants in their own church because of that time they spent on the field. So I don't think it was a waste. I hope it wasn't a waste for them. Mm. No, that's awesome. I, I, I like that you said that. I, I firmly believe that uh, if we don't understand that, uh, well, I mean, ministry or missions, it's just ministry somewhere else. That's all. It, I, now, there's a different context. There's different cultures. But whatever you would do here, evangelizing, disciple making, church planting, building believers up, training them, that's what you're going to do. You're going to do it somewhere else. You're going to have to figure out different ways to do it because of culture and, and language and context. Um, but it's but that's what it is. And uh, so, I yeah, thanks for going there, man. I do want to go to this last facet here before we uh, begin to wrap it up um, mm-hmm. in this idea of calling. So we've talked a lot about, you know, what, you know, demystifying that a little bit. Um, but 
the most popular thing to do when someone is interested in missions is to, like I said earlier, talk about where, where am I going? Where, where is God calling me? And it's more about the work that God is calling us to. Um, but at some point you do got to hammer out the where, and, and that's important. And I think different people can come to that in different ways. Um, but you do have an interesting story in that, you just submitted to that there's needs everywhere in the world. How about I just go to my pastor and uh, let him help me decide, you know, through the word of God, the Holy Spirit, local church, where we should go. Uh, you want to elaborate on that some? Yeah. yeah. Um, I was, I, you know, I, I think at that time I was still probably looking for a, a sort of a, um, you know, the, the heebie-jeebies from the Holy Spirit a little bit and looking for a, <laughs> a particular direction. So I think I psyched myself up again and made myself believe this was, this was God's uh, God's leading and God's calling. Um, but I would say by the time it was time to choose to come to Taiwan, it was, I was probably past that and I was able to just think about it. And because once you, once you do cross that bridge, you might think like, it's really, it's just about, it's about the work. Um, and I knew I wanted to to work in a place that was like where I had just been. And so Taiwan was a pretty, mm -hmm. um, pretty easy fit. But even when we came to Taiwan, you know, you're never really done with the where questions. Mm -hmm. You can get the where done, figure out, you know, uh, what country you want to go to or whatever. Then you got to figure out what city you're going to go to. Mm -hmm. when you get to that city, you got to figure out what neighborhood you're going to go to. And if you just, uh, you know, if you approach those questions, if you approach every one of those qu questions, like waiting for some sort of, uh, of guidance or something like that you're you might make some bad decisions are unwise again the biggest problem with that is that you might not exercise godly wisdom when mm -hmm. you're making when you're making you may not look for a wise counsel because you're just waiting for god to whisper the answer to you um so yeah i think between all those things i don't i really i think again i think there's some fields that require maybe a different level of maturity Obviously, we want everyone who's going as a missionary to be mm -hmm. a mature, uh, godly Christian, um, but some uh, to be at least grounded in their mm -hmm. faith um, and qualified to lead other Christians. Of course. Um, but different fields have different challenges, and mm -hmm. uh, you probably are not, we're probably not the best judge of whether we are qualified, or whether we're really, you know, adequately prepared to meet the challenges of a field. And that's where bringing your local church in or bringing the perspective of another person is so valuable rather than saying, it's fine that you have a desire, you know, but if you tell your pastor, like, you know, I really want to work in China mm -hmm. and your pastor looks at you like you're crazy and says, <laughs> why would you think that? Or, or if he's extremely uncomfortable about it, and that is good reason for you to, that should give you pause and you should mm. really, you should really think long and hard about that. Why, Christians, right? That's probably not a decision that you can see clearly about. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that necessarily means that you need to sit around in your church until the church is like one day, you know, you know what? We need to send Kale. We need to send him to some other country. Like, I don't think it's like <laughs> it's like that. But if you are suggesting it and everybody does not seem to be on board and thinks it's thinks mm -hmm. the problem is you, uh, then that's a that's a you know that's something you should probably think about. Sure, and. and and we really, like we did with, you know, the calling of two missions, this calling of where to go, I think we can demystify it a bit and it can be a lot more logical. And, and maybe, I don't know, maybe as Christians, it's kind of funny, even as Baptists, sometimes we, we maybe we want a little mystery in there of like, ooh, where, where am I going to go? But, um, you know, sometimes it can be very logical. Like I've talked with my pastor before and to other young men, some personalities just work better in different fields. So, you know, going to Africa is going in different parts of Africa, you know, Northern Africa, obviously predominantly Muslim, but then, you know, the Southern parts of Africa, like Malawi and Zambia, that can, a, a personality type there could be completely different than going to Germany or, uh, Northeastern Europe, you know, the Eastern yeah. Bloc countries. And, um, it, it's just th that, that is really logical and, and that's worthy of consideration and considering the need obviously as well. Um, so my story, just to share with you a little bit, I mean, I surrendered to the the what and you know back in uh, it was 2012 I was 21 years old and was like Lord I'm all in you know whatever you want me to do that that was my magical moment I just felt God at a missions conference saying hey you're not all in you're only all in if you're going to be a cushy pastor here in the states I want you to be all in regardless and I was like all right I'm all in kind of figured he would send me somewhere else someday but I didn't know you know I'm just I want to be all in for whatever he says and then you know what it was just a year or two later that I met a pastor up in the Toledo area 
who happened to do ministry in Hungary. And uh, I've only met him. Jeff introduced him to me because my family's Hungarian. I'm half Hungarian. I don't speak the language. My dad didn't live there. But, yeah, it's just my family. He's like, hey, you should meet this guy. He does uh, He does orphan evangelical camps in Hungary. So I met him. He invited me to go. We kept going every year. I've been there nine times. And I'm like, dang, I think we don't have a missionary there. We don't have a church there, but we have all this fruit there. It's like there's sheep without a shepherd. Maybe two plus two equals four. It was a lot less mysterious and way more of a logical equation of God confirming like, hey, if you don't do this, you're like just, you're just like disobeying at this point, you know? Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So God confirmed the where for me a lot easier. My my other friend though, Corey. Um, I think you've met Corey before, Corey Van Sickle. Oh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. he's surrendered to missions. He's doing an internship at our church right now. Uh, he was actually supposed to be in Albania, but um, you know, through a bunch of circumstances, he's he wasn't able to. Um, but he actually, as of the recording of this, you know, I I don't know when this will air, but as of the recording, hasn't decided where he's going yet. It's much more of a I'm all in, and uh, he's surrendered to the Holy Spirit. And our pastor of like, hey, let's figure out the best uh, and most pragmatic place for me to go based on need. Um, and I think that's wonderful. I really, really think that's a cool thing. Right. You know, we, I think we need to um, to go back to something we said way at the beginning. It's like um, we need to abandon this idea that there's this one field where we're going to go and then that's going to be this magical place where everything is going to be spectacular and there's that's going that place is going to be blessed by God. But if I go to some other place, then everything is going to be a disaster. And it's really not like that. You know, it's amazing as poor as Christians are, as bad as we are at making wise decisions. Don't we still see the hands of the fingerprints of God's providence all over our lives? Isn't it an amazing mm-hmm. thing that all the bad decisions I've made in the past, uh, you know, acting in out of fleshly desires, acting out of selfish ambition, acting in sinful ways, even today, I can still see God's hand at work and his fingerprints in, and, and, you know, that his hand is evident in what's happening here that he's still, and so that should probably give me a clue that like, yes, we should try very hard to think through all of the possibilities. We should, we should use wisdom. We should get godly counsel. We should think through all of it. But at the end, we are not as smart as we think we are. We're not mm-hmm. going to think through everything. Uh, and we're going to choose something. And the good news is, is that the promises of God are still unconditional for us mm. in, in those, in those places. Um, yeah. it's not, it doesn't excuse at all a Christian who's making, uh, decisions in, uh, selfish or sinful ways, but for a Christian whose honest desires to glorify God and his, and his actions, we should rest. We should mm. sleep soundly at night and not agonize over decisions. Yeah. Um, we should try to try to do the best that we can. And then if we still continue to agonize, it's really a hint that we do not trust God. Mm. Uh, the outcome. Wow. No, that's really good. And you know what? God is so gracious and he's, is he such a loving God? And, and when we just obey him and let him guide our steps, you know, each step of the way, letting his, you know, his word illuminate our path like a lamp. Um, at least what I've seen for me is, he gives me more confirmation as we continue to obey, which helps because there's times when circumstances are hard or you're depressed or God forbid you get expelled from a country and maybe you're questioning the call at all or questioning, you know, uh, you know, luckily he gives us first Thessalonians five uh, 24, I believe that says faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. But like, I bet that y- I- I'm willing to bet that when you were going through that hardship of being expelled, uh, you had to rest on some of God's previous promises and, and confirmations in your life. Yeah. And I'm really thankful that it wasn't just uh, me just trying to do it by myself that I, you know, God really blessed us in those, in mm. those dark hours with um, a lot of friends and uh, a lot of our supporting churches and uh, missionary friends that we have and, and the faithfulness of local believers of, of our brothers there in China it just uh, blew me away. And, and I think um, if it hadn't been for, uh, there, the, the, the grace that came to me through their testimony, I think I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure that we would have been able to stand as strong as we did. Mm-hmm. I remember when the police came that Sunday morning, uh, it was Easter Sunday. And, um, I was at one of the churches I was supposed to be preaching there that, um, that Sunday. And I didn't have my Red Bull that morning and, <laughs> uh, I have to have my Red Bull every morning. And so 
I was going to leave the church real quick to go grab this a couple minutes before church started. So I opened the door to go downstairs, get it. And there was a, like a troop of men standing in front of the door, like wow. crowding in the door. And I was like, oh, hi, everybody. Come on in. Like, I just thought these were all Easter. <laughs> And then I was like, took a second, I realized, oh no, they're all wearing police, police uniforms. And so they all came in and it was like, you know, there was, they, they, when the police raid a church in China, they always bring like, they, they bring like as many police officers as the church has members. So it's, it's, kind a, of an, it's a statement. Yeah. It's like a big deal. So I never did get my Red Bull that day. My, my head was <laughs> on me. So, but, uh, but I remember that moment, all those police officers came in naturally all the, believers there at the church, they all look to me because the police officers come in and right away they start asking, who's in charge here? Who's the pastor here? Um, you know, that's that's who they're looking for. And of course, naturally, the, I mean, what, what part of me didn't want to just like slink into a corner and be like, I don't know, I don't even know what's going on here, you know? Yeah. But this recognition that like, um, now it's time to, you know, to show these your brothers and sisters in Christ that you're serious about it, that you were serious about that cost, that, mm. um, that Christ really is worthy. Um, and it was a wonderful thing as painful as it was, it was a wonderful thing to walk through with my brothers and sisters there in China and I'll never forget it. And I think it really bound us together in a way that, um, that nothing ever had before. I think I've seen that in other, other churches in China that have experienced that it really does, um, bind together the hearts of the believers that go through something like that. Yeah. And, and God gives you that, that pile of stones to be able to look back on in the future and be like, Oh yeah, I remember that was hard, but God brought us through it. Um, because he's so gracious, man, that that's amazing, man. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, um, and for sharing this wisdom and experience that, that you have. Um, I know for a fact that it is, has been beneficial for somebody out there. So th thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure, man. Thanks. Well, there you go. I hope that was encouraging and edifying to you as, as much as it was for me. Um, Jake is an amazing missionary and uh, an amazing man of God, and, and uh, the fruit of his ministry um, is obvious, and, and I think you guys could tell just from his conversation how much he loves the Lord and, and loves uh, missions as well and, and loves the people that he ministers to. Um, if you want to find out more about Jake or his ministry, you can go to gospelinchina.com. And if you'd like to find his book, you can uh, go on Amazon or Google. Uh, the name of the book is Send Me, I'll Go. Uh, and the subtitle is Letting the Mission Choose Your Direction uh, by Jake Tobby. And Tobby is spelled T-A-U-B-E. I uh, highly recommend it. It's a great read. And, uh, and Jake uh, really, uh, not only is he an experienced veteran missionary, but he really is incredibly wise. Uh, and smart as well and, and just has a lot of good things to say and to consider if uh, if you're someone who's considering or kicking around it is is foreign mission something that I'm supposed to do with my life uh, why not just take a leap of faith trust the Lord and prepare uh, God will use people who are prepared and obedient um, I can I I can't guarantee you many things about what God's going to use you to do but I can guarantee you that if you aren't prepared he won't be able to use you you need to be able to get on track. Whatever your church has, whatever discipleship outlet they have, um, if your church has a a, a Bible uh, college, um, if if uh, they take part in LFBI, if you're if you're not part of the Living Faith Fellowship of churches, uh, you can check out that website lffellowship.com, and we have a Bible Institute that our fellowship shares the pastors um, to teach those things to prepare you for ministry and for missions. Um, and, uh, that's called LFBI. It stands for living faith Bible Institute. You can do that. Uh, you can look more into that by checking out LFBI.org, but really we should all be preparing ourselves and, and being disciples so that we can be more effective ministers of Christ. And if God calls you as you're ministering and as you are being prepared to go do that ministry that you're already doing here somewhere else in the world, well, that wouldn't be as big of a leap, would it? It would certainly be something uh, that would be glorifying to God and less glorifying to ourselves if he would use us in that capacity. I hope that was encouraging. God bless you all. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you next week. God bless. Thanks for listening. Please rate and subscribe and share us on social media. Also, please make sure to check out our other podcast, Theology Roundtable, at theologyroundtable.com.